All right, we're going to begin our video lecture on lab number one, Organization of the Body. This is found on pages one through three in your lab packet that you purchased out in the bookstore, the $9 supplement with the purple cover. Uh, the back half, the second half of that packet has all the lab objectives for this semester. So we have lab number one found on pages one through three. The um, objectives in that lab are described in a document called Lab Notes, which is found in the Intro to Anatomy lab folder on Blackboard. So you should print that out before you watch this video. Make sure you have the lab notes, as well as the PowerPoint, which is what is shown here in this video. I'll be going through the PowerPoint, and we'll be talking about the different parts, and you'll label it as we go through the PowerPoint together. So be sure you have the lab notes printed off, and you also have this PowerPoint printed off so you can write on it as we go through the lab right now. <coughs> so pages one through three in your lab package should also be open so you can see the terms that we're going to be covering, and you also know the correct spelling of those terms. So be sure to have pages one through three handy for quick reference of spelling. So objective number one, asks you to describe and recognize anatomical position. If we look at the woman in this picture, this is on page 18 of your textbook as well, <coughs> we can see she is in what we call <coughs> excuse me, anatomical position, which means her body is facing forward, her palms are facing forward, and her feet are facing forward. We call that anatomical position. That way, when we're communicating about our patients in healthcare, we are using the same position for all of our patients, whether they're sitting in a wheelchair, lying on their stomach, lying on their side. When we talk about parts of their body, we're using the same position, and this is called anatomical position. So be able to describe that. The body's standing upright, feet and palms are facing forward. The next part of this slide talks about body planes. Sometimes when you're looking at a model or a tissue slide, it's just a portion of a body part. It's been cut through a plane, and there's three different major planes which we make our cuts. A plane that divides the body into, or the part, into left and right sides is what we call the sagittal plane. Right here is an example of the sagittal plane. So be sure you have your lab objectives, your packet, um, in the purple packet you purchased in the bookstore, pages one through three. Page one has a description, not a description, but has a, you know, the quick spelling of each of these terms. So you want on your PowerPoint that you have in front of you, label this plane here, the sagittal plane. We can further describe the sagittal plane by being either mid-sagittal or parasagittal. Mid-sagittal means we have equal left and right sides. So we can see in this example, this sagittal plane would be mid-sagittal because it's going right down the middle through the navel. So that would be a mid-sagittal section as well. We could be more descriptive saying that. Parasagittal would be, for example, if we were going to cut this woman through the level of the eye, that would be unequal left and right halves. So that would be a parasagittal cut. So mid-sagittal is equal left and right sides, parasagittal unequal left and right sides. But the key term to focus on here is sides. Left and right sides is a sagittal cut. Coronal or frontal means we're having, when we're done with that cut, we have a front and back portion of that body or part. So this plane here would be an example of a frontal plane because it divides her into a front half and a back half. The term coronal means the same thing. So whenever you see two terms in your lab packet, that just means you can choose one or the other, whichever makes most sense to you. We don't require you to use both. Transverse means you're dividing a part into top and bottom halves. So this plane here, you would label transverse because we have a top half and we have a bottom half. This is the transverse plane. Like when a magician cuts his assistant in half, that is a transverse cut. And now we can apply this concept to vegetables or fruits. For example, pickles on a cheeseburger, those would be transverse cuts because they're cut into a top and bottom portion or on a banana split, uh, that would be a sagittal cut because you have left and right sides. Moving on then to directional terminology. 
when we're talking about a position of a body part or a part of a body part, maybe there's a pressure ulcer on a patient or there's a broken bone on a patient and we wanted to communicate with other members of the healthcare team where that pressure ulcer is or where that broken bone is, we want to use the same terminology. So the terms that you see in this set of objectives refer to terminology across the body. Again, we're assuming anatomical position when we talk about this terminology. So superior versus inferior. Superior means toward the head and inferior means toward the feet. Toward the head is superior, toward the feet is inferior. So if we're looking at body parts, for example, if we look at, say, the eyes, we would say the eyes are superior to the mouth. They're more, they're closer to the head than they are to the, than the mouth is. So the eyes are closer to the head than the mouth. So the eyes are superior to the mouth. And then we could say that the nose is inferior to the eyes. The nose is closer to the feet than the eyes are. So that's superior, inferior. Anterior, posterior. Anterior is toward the front of the body. Posterior is toward the back side of the body. So we could say that the eyes are anterior to the ears. The eyes are closer to the front side of the body than the ears are. And we could say the ears are posterior to the eyes, closer to the back side of the body. Medial and lateral. Medial means toward the midline. So we could say that the nose is medial to the eyes, closer to the midline than the eyes are. And we could say that the ears are lateral to the eyes. Now we also use that example with anterior and posterior, but there's more than one possibility for some of these terms. We could say that the ears are posterior to the eyes, and we could also say that the ears are lateral to the eyes. Either one would be correct. So toward the midline is medial, away from the midline of the body is lateral. Again, if the body is standing in anatomical position. Superficial versus deep. Superficial means closer to the body surface. Deep means further from the body surface. For example, in this model here of the skin, we could say that the epidermis is superficial to the dermis, closer to the body surface than the dermis is. And we could say that the subcutaneous layer down here, deeper in the skin, is deep to the dermis. In looking at general layers of, of tissue as we go from the surface deeper into the body, we could say that the skin is superficial to the fat. We could say that muscle is deep to the skin. So it's a, sup it's a, it's a surface um, direction that we're looking at when we talk about superficial versus deep. One more I didn't mention was the proximal versus distal. Proximal is, and distal are terms we use for the arms and legs. So if I say that something is proximal, that means it's closer to the point of attachment to the body. For example, the hip is proximal to the knee. The hip is closer to the point of attachment than the knee is. And I could say that the ankle is distal to the knee. It's further from the point of attachment than the knee is and the point of attachment that the knee and the ankle have in common would be the hip. So the knee is closer to the hip than the ankle is, so we say the knee is proximal to the ankle. So the words proximal and distal refer to a body part or a limb. For example, if I'm looking at a bone in the lower leg, for example, someone breaks the proximal tibia, which is a bo large bone in the lower leg, that means they broke their tibia in this region. If they broke the distal tibia, we would say they broke that bone down lower in the leg. So proximal means closer to the main frame of the body and the point of attachment, and distal means further from the point of attachment. On Blackboard, in the folder for lab, there's several different interactive animations that you can work with that give you lots of practice on body cavities, directional terminology, and body regions. I highly recommend that you practice with those through those animations to get yourself comfortable with these terms. The next section in our lab packet are the body cavities. There's two major body cavities shown here in this diagram. The yellow one shows the dorsal body cavity. That's the part of the body cavity up on the back side of the body. And the two parts of the dorsal cavity are the cranial cavity and the vertebral cavity. 
The cranial cavity contains the brain. The vertebral cavity contains the spinal cord. Together they make up the dorsal body cavity. And as we know, the brain and spinal cord are very fragile. And notice that this body cavity is completely encased by bone. The skull contains the brain and the spine completely, with the help of the vertebrae, wraps around that spinal cord. These body cavities found on the front side of the body, together, collectively, all three of these cavities, we call the ventral body cavity. And that ventral body cavity is further divided into the thoracic cavity, which is found above the diaphragm. And the diaphragm would be a sheet of muscle we would find right about here. So you can draw that in, the diaphragm, because that's your landmark to define the thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic cavity. So this is the thoracic cavity. And we'll talk about the parts of the thoracic cavity in just a minute, but let's jump down to the abdominal pelvic cavity. These two together are the abdominal pelvic cavity. But when we get about the level of the hip, there's a division there where we have the pelvic cavity separated from the abdominal cavity. So the abdominal cavity contains the digestive organs, and the pelvic cavity contains the, the ovaries in the female, and the urinary bladder. So these are the major cavities of the ventral body cavity. Here's a front view where you can see some more further division of the ventral body cavity. So on either side of the heart, so here's the heart, we have two pleural cavities. Pleural is P-L-E-U-R-A-L. -E if you look in your lab packet, you can see the correct spelling for that. And that refers to lungs. Whenever you hear the prefix pleur, think lungs. If a person has pleurisy, they're probably going to have trouble breathing. And they do because of the inflammation of the membranes around the lungs. So pleur means lungs. We have two pleural cavities, one around each lung. Then we have this major large region between the lungs made up of, looks like, two different cavities. This is called the mediastinum. This whole region between the lungs is a larger cavity called the mediastinum. Think of media for middle and stinum, which is the sternum, which is what is found in front of this cavity. So the mediastinum is found in the middle here. And that is further divided into the region that contains the heart. This is called the pericardial cavity. Pericardial cavity, which contains the heart. And that's the regions, those are the regions of the thoracic cavity that you have to be familiar with. The two pleural cavities, the mediastinum, collectively this area, and then the pericardial cavity, specifically around the heart. So now if we move below the diaphragm, here's where the diaphragm looks good. It's a thin sheet of muscle that helps with respiration. We get below that, we have the abdominal pelvic cavity, another region, re another name for the abdominal cavity is the peritoneal cavity. So if you hear about peritoneal fluid, we're talking about fluid found in the abdominal cavity. And there's a bunch of reasons why a person might have an increase in peritoneal fluid, but you'll learn more about that in advanced a &P. So this is the peritoneal or abdominal cavity. And when we get below the level of the hip here, we have that smaller cavity, which is the pelvic cavity, which we said contains the reproductive organs and the urinary bladder. So moving on to serous membranes. Each of those cavities is lined with a special membrane that not only holds that organ in place, but it also comes back and covers the organ found in that cavity. So if you look in your lab objectives at your list of membranes you have to know, you'll see that each membrane starts with the word either visceral or parietal. And the visceral layer is the layer of this membrane that covers the organ itself. And the parietal layer is that layer that lines the body cavity around that organ. For example, if this fist represented the heart, the heart is surrounded by a membrane with two different names depending on what part of the membrane we're referring to. So if this is the heart, this part of the balloon, which is in contact with the fist, would be called the visceral pericardium. And this outer membrane that's not touching the heart, but which would be touching the body wall, if we put this water balloon into a body cavity, 
This is called a parietal pericardium. So in this diagram, the visceral pericardium is what would cover the heart itself. And then as that visceral pericardium gets to the end of the heart and touches the body wall, it doubles back and lines the body wall. So this outer layer would be the parietal pericardium. Here we can look at this example over here with the lungs. We have, again, the inner layer that covers the heart itself would be the visceral pericardium. And the outer layer that would come out and line the body cavity around the heart, that would be the parietal pericardium. Then we look at the two lungs. The lungs, same thing. They are attached to the body wall, and that body wall around the lungs is lined with the membrane named parietal pleura. Remember, pleur means lung, so that's where the pleura comes from. And then as that parietal pleura lines the body cavity and gets near the center toward the lung, it folds back and covers the lung itself. And where it covers the lung itself, that is the visceral pleura. So again, parietal, on a lab exam, you want to look for the word body wall or body cavity. If you're looking, if the answer involves a visceral membrane, then you're going to look at does that membrane cover the organ? If the question or the note card on the lab exam says name the membrane covering this organ, you know we're looking for a visceral membrane. And as long as you know what the organ is, you can determine if it's going to be peritoneum, pleura, or pericardium. Any digestive organ or any organ below the diaphragm is going to have a second name of peritoneum. So the liver, the stomach, the intestines, those are all covered with a membrane called the visceral peritoneum. And that membrane, after it lines the organ, it comes back and attaches to the body wall and lines the body cavity around that organ. And that portion of the membrane we call the parietal peritoneum. So if I asked a question on a, on a lab exam that asked you to name the membrane that lines the body cavity around the lungs, you would say, parietal pleura. If that's what you answered, you are correct. If I asked you to name the membrane that covers the heart, you would say, visceral pericardium. That would be correct. If I asked you to name the membrane that lines the body cavity around the liver, you would say, Parietal peritoneum. That would be correct. 